Welcome to the first 2018 The Nutritionist webinar. I'm Marianne Fezenden from AMTS, and I'm your English language host. We're excited to return for this, our fourth year in this monthly webinar series, dedicated to providing technical talks from internationally recognized educators for listeners around the world. Paula Torillo from Cordoba, Argentina, translates and hosts the Spanish language webinar. Marcelo Hence Ramos from 3R Lab normally joins us, but he informed me last week that it is Carnival and he's not going to be here today. We are very pleased to welcome Tom Long from Heyman Wei in China. He's going to be hosting in Mandarin. There will be a question and answer period immediately following the presentation. Listeners can submit questions through me, Paula, or Tom. A complete recording of archived webinars, as well as a question and answer session for each, will be available on the AMTS website. For those of you who would listen to the presentations while driving, we've converted the videos to MP3 files that can be downloaded to your device for offline listening. This month, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Chris Chase, who's a professor of veterinary science at South Dakota State University in Brookings, South Dakota. He was involved in clinical practice and consulting for almost 30 years. His research and diagnostic interests are in bovine and porcine immunology, respiratory disease pathogenesis, emerging bovine diseases with wildlife interface and vaccine development. Dr. Chase is the president of the American College of Veterinary Microbiology. Dr. Chase co-founded RTI, Research Technology Innovation, LLC, an animal health contract research organization founded in 1994 and has served as president since 1998. Today, Dr. Chase will address the topic of nutrition and immunology. His talk completes a mini sequence on that topic. Last fall, we were honored to host Drs. Lance Baumgard and Michael Ballou, both of whom addressed how nutrition can contribute to health concerns. Dr. Chase, thank you. We look forward to learning more. I am going to open up your mic and we'll hope that everything works. All right. Well, well I'm, I'm um, pleased to be here. I've actually, um, I mean, in, actually in Kansas today, I've got to do a, a seminar series tomorrow here. So I, uh, I was fortunate enough that I could get down here and, and, and do this today. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, um, to speak to you today uh, on, on this subject. Uh, it's, it's nutrition and immunology, uh, understanding how to maximize the good and minimize the bad. First of all, um, before I get started, uh, I want to um, give credit to a number of people whose slides I've used in this presentation uh, today, and uh, we'll see actually uh, kind of the, the stressed out cow uh, slide comes from uh, Barry Bradford, uh, and I've got slides from uh, Patricia Lovefruller uh, at uh, Howard Hughes, uh, Mike Kogut at ARS, uh, and then from a couple different uh, textbooks, uh, Kubi's Immunology, uh, and then the, uh, one of the movies you're going to see today is, is from a book entitled Immunobiology. Uh, and then finally, um, Dr. David Topham, many years ago, uh, loaned me really a great series of slides, and uh, I continue to use those because they've just been uh, so helpful. So I want to just get, make sure that I give credit to those people whose materials I'm using today. So we're going to talk about really four different areas today. So um, I'm going to talk about the immune system. We're going to do just kind of a a quick uh, overview of the of the of the immune system itself, and then we're going to turn our attention to the immune system in stress because that really uh, is is a key component that we need to understand. Uh, then we'll talk about immunity as it relates to energy, and this is a lot of things that I'm going to share with you. There actually uh, come from uh, some slides that uh, Marcus Curley uh, at the uh, National Animal Disease Center uh, loaned to me. Uh, and then uh, we'll look at gut immunity and commensals because I think that's really, as we're going forward, uh, going to be a very hot uh, topic and an area that we need to understand along with mucosal immunity. Those two things um, are tied together um, very nicely, uh, and I, I want to make sure that we're aware of that because one of the things that I hope I leave you with 
uh, as of uh, or a factoid today is that, that in fact that the, the gastrointestinal tract, in fact, is the largest immune organ of the body. So I think it's important that we spend some time uh, talking about that today. So let's begin then and look at the, the basic of the, of the immune response. And so what we know is that, in fact, barriers, uh, and so the, the mucosa itself, skin, the uh, epithelial cells line, the respiratory tract, the digestive tract, the reproductive tract, all provide uh, a tremendous barrier uh, and, and, and a physical barrier that is, is, in most cases, highly effective in terms of preventing diseases. Certainly for those, obviously, diseases that are um, transmitted by droplets, so say through the uh, gastrointestinal tract or through the respiratory tract, uh, obviously, uh, this the system um, becomes breached if you're talking about arboviruses because obviously they were talking there about viruses that are uh, carried by an insect and get past this first barrier. But this line of defense, I used to when I would give uh, this show this slide, we'd spend very little time on it, and you're going to see that actually once we get to the third part of the talk, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at this particular uh, region just because it's so important when we talk about immunity. Typically, when we think about vaccination, um, uh, we think of actually that we breach that barrier. So again, that we've, uh, with a syringe or if we've used an intranasal vaccine, uh, we've actually breached the barrier and then we actually engage the innate immune system. And, and I like to think of the innate immune system kind of like a fire alarm, uh, and, and, excuse me, and, and a smoke sensor. So its job is to sense that something's going on and then to recruit uh, more of the immune system in to actually get things going. And it, and it does that um, through, um, let me get my point going here again, uh, through a number of uh, different what we call pro-inflammatory mediators or, or cytokines. Uh, and those, their job is to activate uh, the immune system, uh, activate the bone marrow, we'll talk about that in just a little bit, uh, and then, this, then the, we have a number of cells themselves that are involved uh, in this. Uh, and so you see that uh, phagocytosis, you know, which is usually carried out uh, in this system, particularly by neutrophils, is really important in terms of eliminating bacteria. And then there's another interesting cell that you see at the end of that line, uh, NK cells, stands for natural killer cells. And those are cells that were first uh, described in people uh, and actually were associated with killing tumor cells. But we know they kill virally infected cells. And the other interesting thing about those is that they provide uh, a connection. And you see that over here in terms of the sort of this, the interaction that occurs between innate and adaptive immunity that NK cells are cells that, that connect innate and adaptive immunity. And there's several other cells that do that as well. Now, the other thing that's key though, that again, that the innate immune response does is that it, it turns on inflammation. And inflammation is really important in terms of really, again, mobilizing the immune system. And then when that happens, uh, so what we hope is that if it's an infection, that we uh, will mobilize what we need to kind of uh, take care of that infection. But then when we're looking particularly at a vaccine or long-term immunity, that, that when that inflammatory response turns on, it, then we'll in turn activate adaptive immunity. And adaptive immunity is that part of the immune system then, that specific that has memory. So when we get a vaccine and we want to get antibodies or we want to get um, T cells, what we're looking at there then is again, is that third line, the adaptive immune response. And it again is a, a, the system that, that it's really important when we, we're talking about vaccines because it's what gives us then uh, uh, memory. So we have duration of immunity, specificity, uh, and again, because it'll be specific for whatever we're vaccinating for. So those three you know, they work together, but innate and adaptive, once adaptive, excuse me, innate immunity is activated, it then in turn activates adaptive immunity, and, and, and you can't have one without the other. So if you don't activate the innate immune system, you won't see much of an adaptive immune response. So that's why it's important, uh, particularly when we're talking about vaccines, that we will talk about that inflammation is an is important, uh, important component of, of being able to make sure that our vaccines work. Okay, so that's sort of my, the little overview then of the immune system. Now, on the other side of the equation now, so the immune system is the animal's response against disease, against its environment, and all those. On the other side are the things particularly that result, that, that, that can occur either to the animal or from the environment that the animal's in, and those are stressors. 
And these stressors, and I've just what I've got listed here, are just uh, are just a just name name a few. Uh, but we know that, for example, that commingling, so bringing animals together from different sources, uh, uh, has a major effect on animals because there there's a social stress. Uh, animals are adapting to each other. Uh, they're new, and they're not, then uh, and, and that's we know a very big risk factor in terms of when we look at disease occurrences that if animals have been commingled, that's, a, that's one of the major things that we see. Obviously, injury would be uh, is something that obviously that puts the animal at risk. And one thing, again, another thing that I'd like to leave you with today is the importance of hydration or water. The, you're going to see uh, in, the one of the, in both of the movies I'm going to show you, you're going to see that cells are moving, that that's a key part of the immune system. So if we have animals that are dehydrated, uh, it's going to affect the barrier itself. So we'll talk about that when we look at that at that movie. And then, but it just talk, but it also affects how cells can move from one part of the body to the other. So, so dehydration and some work that was done by John Richardson at Texas A&M uh, has shown that actually that when you look at risk factors for for bovine respiratory disease, that actually dehydration is one of the highest. That if animals are dehydrated; they're almost four times more likely develop bovine respiratory disease in animals that are, that are, that are hydrated. Then the next thing you see is, is feed. And again, we're going to talk particularly about the microbiome in a little bit. Uh, but, but feed, uh, and also about the energy requirements of the immune system. So it's really important, again, that, uh, that our feeds uh, be available, that our feeds be palatable, that, our, that uh, you know, animals ha you know, frequently, what ha often happens is when we vaccinate animals, we do that right when they arrive. So they haven't really on a very good plan of nutrition. And hopefully you'll see today that indeed that we need to have a good plan of nutrition to get a good immune response. And then there's, there's things obviously that have to do with density, uh, total number of animals uh, that are involved. Uh, again, uh, because that again will affect both in terms of social stress and also you know, the ability of animals to, to get enough to eat or to drink. So all those things uh, will have an effect. Uh, heat stress is probably one of the hardest things that we have uh, on the immune system. Uh, and I'll sh show you an example of that a little bit later. Um, but, but anyway, but heat stress is, is, in terms of having a really dramatic effect on the ability of an animal's immune system respond, really um, is, is, is really can be quite severe. And then uh, the next two things, handling the movements in fear and flight, uh, we'll talk about the, uh, those a little bit further here in, in the next slide, but it, it turns out that uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, which are associated with, uh, again, with, with fear and flight. So again, when we're moving animals, doing it in a calm way that they don't become uh, overly anxious, uh, because those, those uh, uh, fear and flight hormones have a very negative effect on the immune system. Uh, then the next thing you see is add-ons, and again, that's, that just means putting into a pen. It's really kind of back, kind of a, uh, looking at co-mingling in a, in a little slightly different way. Then we certainly know that weather extremes. So in terms of uh, big temperature changes, uh, for example, today in South Dakota it's almost 50 degrees, and uh, two days ago it was uh, five degrees below zero. And that's uh, those kind of those kind of changes will have a have a big effect in terms of on the immune system. And then certainly in, in parts of the world where uh, it's dry, which can be lots of parts, dust is a big issue. And then you see, again, there's competition. And that really, again, relates back to pen density and, uh, and total numbers. So, so as I mentioned, stress has this uh, uh, interesting effect that it has on the immune system. So, so any of the factors that we just talked about um, that, that cause stress, that stress then in turn affects the central nervous system. And that in turn, affects a number of hormonal regulated systems. Uh, and these systems all have a, a direction that actually interacts with the immune system. Okay? And what you'll see is that those arrows are actually bi-directional. So in other words, if the immune system is activated, it too is then gonna have a direct effect on the central nervous system. So these things work back and forth. And over here you see um, fear and flight. So you see fear and flight and the idea that again, the autonomic nerve system has an effect on the immune system and it can obviously has an effect on the neurotransmitters. So the whole thing, to, what I'm trying, point I'm trying to make here is that we have this very tight connection between the nervous system and the immune system. And, and so and, and it's, and it's bi-directional. So it goes in both directions 
and, and so again, so things that we that that we call that that are stressors that will work in this direction. Where on the other hand, uh, those things that are, actually occur in terms of infections and, and those things also have a negative effect uh, going in the other direction to, on the central nervous system. So those two things are tied very closely together. Uh, and I think, you know, and, and we actually refer to that as, as the immune neural axis, that these two things are very closely tied together. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about stress immunity. And I'm going to use as my example uh, a bovine respiratory disease. Okay, so bovine respiratory disease is a multifactorial disease, okay, that, that, that uh, usually involves uh, viruses, bacteria, and then some kind of stressor to the animal, okay? And that's what we see here. And so you can see that if it's just the virus on its own without any other complications, it's, it resolves itself pretty easily. But what those viruses do do is they cause damage, as do things like mycoplasma uh, causes damage, and then this allows these uh, bacteria then to then invade deeper into the tissue, get into the lung, and actually cause bacterial pneumonia. Now, on, on the other side, it's supposed to be the good guy, and that's the immune system. So the immune system's job then is to block that, okay, is to, is to stop uh, that, uh, whether it's bacteria, uh, mycoplasma, viruses from um, doing their thing. But what we know then is that if we have stressors on that immune system, that has a negative effect on the immune system, okay? So instead of the immune system being able to sort of stop that, uh, the, immune, the immune system is blocked, and we know that viruses can do that directly, so they can block the immune system. Uh, we know, uh, you know that, that some bacteria also have a negative effect on the immune system, so it then prevents that immune system from uh, minimizing bacterial pneumonia. Now, the other thing that you'll see here is, is this uh, psychological stress. So you see we have physical stress, environmental stress, but you'll see with the pointer is, has a psychological stress. This is back to fear and flight again. And interestingly, what we know about that is that, um, oops, it, is that, in fact, those hormones, okay, uh, that are associated with fear and flight, uh, it turns out that many bacteria have receptors on their surface that can actually sense that and actually grow better when that animal is under that kind of psychological stressor with fear and flight. So, again, that's why I mentioned earlier the idea of trying to minimize uh, our handling of animals so that we have less fear and flight, and that the animals are able to, to um, be handled you know, in, a, in a more calm manner really can have a, a major effect in terms of how these animals will respond. Now I'm going to turn to an example uh, of, of, a, of a stressor. In this case, the stressor is, is transportation. This is a, an Italian paper. And I want to just make a, a, a one point with this. And, and, and the point I want to make here is that what they did is they hauled these animals um, several uh, hundred kilometers. And then they actually they measured uh, the white blood cells in these animals. Um, so before departure, um, at arrival, 24 hours after arrival, and seven days after arrival. Okay? And what they're doing, they're, they're measuring it in the blood. Okay? So if, if you look uh, at the total, so this is the total number of white blood cells, that you can see that over time they decrease. Okay? And you'll see in particular that neutrophils decrease. Okay? And, um, and the thing is, when we say that they, they, they're no longer in the blood, it turns out that actually when it comes to bovine respiratory disease that these neutrophils actually move into the lung and that causes this problem. So again, so here in this case is stress causing the immune system to respond. In this case, the response is actually a, a case where the, the immune system is actually going to over-respond because these neutrophils now move into the lung. And once neutrophils do that, they can, they can cause um, some major issues. Now, the next uh, thing that I want to show you, this is a, a, a different study. This is a study that was done in Canada. Uh, and what we're looking at here, so instead of looking at the cells that are in the blood, we're actually looking at the cells that are now in the lung. Okay, they're actually in the something called the bronchial alveolar fluid. Uh, so they've actually um, taken the, 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 the cells from, the, or taken the fluid from the lungs, and they're measuring the white blood cells that are in there. So what you can see is that, that early on, in, in their, and when they say stressed or non-stressed, they actually had a, a set of calves that they moved physically from uh, overnight from one location to another, and then they kept compared those to animals that were not moved at all. 
Uh, and so the animals that were um, stressed, they left them overnight um, so that they um, had, you know, they were probably dehydrated, they hadn't had a good meal, so they had several uh, different things they did. And the other thing that they did to them was they also practiced a cl uh, closed castration. So there's multiple stressors. But what you'll see then, interestingly enough, is that so 36 hours after um, the stress, what you'll, what you'll see then is that actually the, there's a lot of neutrophils that actually move into the lung. In fact, most of the white blood cells, so you see that the total number here is 1.25. Of that 1.25, almost all of it is neutrophils. Okay? And then those neutrophils move into the lung. And the trouble with neutrophils is that when they leave the bloodstream and get into tissue, they do one thing, and that is, is they die. Their job is to go in and eliminate bacteria and die. So that's, that's and, and they're moving into this, in, in, in that area. So that then, re, you know, results then in uh, inflammation typically because, again, these cells, as they um, die, um, they release contents, which then turns on inflammatory cytokines. This, this next slide is also from that same uh, study. In this case, so what they're measuring is actually, in this case, something in the blood. They're actually, again, so we have the stressed animals and the non-stressed animals. And you can see that the stressed animals that we're measuring in this case acute phase proteins. And so these acute phase proteins, you can see, actually increase, you know, quite, you know, quite, to quite a degree, you know, after that, after the initial um, stressor. And the other thing that you can see, and again, and nothing that you see at all in non stress is that there's actually a difference between males and females, that actually females, well, when placed under stress, actually have even a more severe acute phase proteins. And so again, we're measuring the levels that are actually in the blood. Now, why is this important? Well, there's been some 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 very nice work that that's actually shown that um, as we look at this, this inflammatory response. So here you see the inflammatory response so that could, can occur from um, the neutrophils moving into the lung, uh, the, the, the stressors that occur. So again, we're back to the stress and the effect it has on uh, the release of these different um, um, inflammatory cytokines. And one of the things that you can see that it does is it actually affects the brain. Okay, so it affects the brain really at three levels. It affects the brain in terms of appetite. So these animals have less appetite. The second thing that happens is, is that typically that they will also affect the, the, the centers for activity. So these animals don't want to, uh, you know, uh, their attitude is, is poor in terms of they don't want to get up. And they're, you know, they're, they're much more lethargic. And then the third thing, which is probably the thing that you, you know, you think of probably the most is, is fever. So those three, three things are activated then when we have an inflammatory response that goes in an animal. And then now we're looking at the turning on then this, this axis in between the central nervous system and the immune system. So you see what happens is that, again, it can be either through the brain or it can be directly on the effect it has on the liver. And probably with half the glandulin, most of what we're looking at is this effect on the liver. So the liver uh, uh, becomes activated, and in doing that, what happens then is that the liver begins to produce acute phase proteins. And acute phase proteins, in fact, are uh, not all that, in terms of from a metabolism standpoint, not all that easy to make. And so it involves a lot of uh, catabolism and those kind of things. And so what happens is, is that the liver, which normally should be a good metabolism machine, helping the animal in terms of growth and lean, when you have an inflammatory response, what happens is that liver then becomes, it wants to be an immune organ. And it turns out we know that in young cats, so in the developing calf, before there's any bone marrow, uh, the biggest organ that's in the body is the liver. And if you look at, and I had one of my graduate students, we had studied um, calves from uh, day 79 of gestation uh, up to, uh, to about day 200, and, and you look at the liver, and the liver changes dramatically in terms of the immune cells that are in it from, say, day 79 or 80 uh, until you get to day 200. As bone marrow is formed, or excuse me, as bones formed, those cells will move out. But again, the liver is the first immune organ. So when it's, it sees an inflammatory response, it wants to behave as an immune organ. But what that does is that decreases efficiency in that animal. So one of the things that we understand is that as you see increases of half the glycolin, this has been some nice work that's been done in the pig, that you also see that lean and growth goes down in those same animals. In other words, that there's, there's a cost. Uh, when you turn that inflammatory response on, the cost is, is that, that we're losing uh, uh, the metabolism, the metabolism machine that the liver should normally be, and it's turned into an immune organ, which is not particularly um, good at. 
So then when we get, we get those, these, these neutrophils, these cells moving into the tissue, uh, and again, what they do, uh, as I mentioned before, is they move into the tissue and then they release their products, and that just causes more inflammation, and that will result in tissue damage. That's what you're seeing in this little cartoon here, is that uh, as tissue damage occurs, the tissue itself then um, becomes, gets, it gets uh, uh, thrown by in it, and the tissue um, becomes not, no longer viable, uh, and it ends up giving us uh, something that looks like this. Okay, this is a lung, so let me help you out with the, the landmarks here. So this is the, the, um, the lung of a calf that died of a fibrinous pneumonia. So I'm just gonna kind of work my way around it here. So you can see this is the lung. And you can see that this is covered with fibrin and a number, and fibrin is a acute phase protein, and, and with a number of other proteins that are activated, uh, again, because the immune system, particularly the innate immune system, actually overreacted. Okay, so this is back to the, the again, because of the stressor, white blood cells moved into the lung. Uh, they themselves are there to, to help with, with the infection, but again, because there's so many of them there, especially if they move in, in large numbers, they themselves can actually cause um, uh, damage to, to that animal's lung. Now, another thing, okay, so this is the, in this case, again, what we looked at is in inflammation and damage that's a result from, in this case, uh, too much of an immune response. The other thing that we know, and this gets back to a metabolic issue, is that there's a relationship between inflammation and adipose tissue. So as animals, um, so as I've listed here, we have the fat weaning calf, um, uh, cattle that we're finishing, so at the end, uh, getting ready to, to slaughter them, and then the fresh dairy cow who, who's been in a dry cow period, but now uh, is uh, getting, you know, getting ready to calf, so she's accumulated um, adipose tissue. And, and what we know is, is, is that that adipose tissue, and we know this from people, is um, with chronic inflammatory disease, that, that when we deal with, with um, chronic inflammatory disease in people, so we see, we see, we see you know, increase in diabetes, we see increase in heart disease, it's with people that are, that are obese and who have more adipose tissue. Because the thing that, that, that adipose tissue does is that produces something called um, IL-6. It's in one of those inflammatory cytokines, and they produce that all the time, which then makes macrophages okay, that, are, that are in the adipose tissue or nearby um, become activated. And then when they become activated, they produce more of these pro-inflammatory cytokines and when that happens, then we just ha we it, it increases then this whole inflammatory response, which again, chronic inflammatory responses are not good for productivity and are not good for for the animal's health. And so that's that's what we're trying to work. On the other hand, we know, and again, this is some work that's been done in people that if someone is lean, interestingly enough, they don't their adipose tissue actually has in it is eosinophils, which it seems you know, we think of eosinophils as being associated with allergy, but in fact, we know that. Now we know that if eosinophils are present, most of the time what they would indicate to us is that in fact the animal is trying to deal with an inflammatory response. These cells actually will help neutralize an inflammatory response. So uh, we've seen in cases where animals, uh, and again we're not talking about high levels of eosinophils in terms of uh, 10 to 15 percent, but we're talking about four or five percent that as animals increase, they have higher levels of eosinophils they will actually get less bovine respiratory disease. And again, this, so there's this whole interaction. And, and, and so up here I have listed this, the fat weaning calf. So this is, again, an animal that ha is, is over-conditioned. It's, it's obese. And then all of a sudden you wean it and change its diet. And now that fat becomes mobilized. And then now we've increased. So that's what I talked down here about negative energy balance. That then has an, it causes more of these inflammatory cytokines and it causes us more problems. So again, there's many different areas of metabolism that affect in terms of how the immune response will occur, or in this case, again, probably over, overshoot its mark. And this diagram just further follows up on that. So here again, you, you see the fact that these, the, the, the fat cells, the adipocytes produce this IL-6. And again, the IL-6 then in turn activates these macrophages and then causes them to produce more inflammatory cytokines, something called um, TNF, and then again, that really exasperates what we're talking about. Now, what I want, the point that I want to make here uh, in this particular slide is that uh, if we have an animal that we're changing its diet, okay, so we weaned it, 
it was on a milk diet. Now it's on a on a, uh, a concentrate diet, and depending on whether it's a high energy concentrate diet, that diet change is going to affect the bacteria that are in there. We'll talk more about the microbiome a little bit, but it'll change them. And, and depending on what populations are affected, if we end up producing more gram negative bacteria, what happens with the gram negative bacteria is that they produce that they in their cell wall, they contain something called LPS. Okay, and LPS is a cell component that the immune system really overreacts to, okay? And so what you see here is LPS can actually move across the epithelium, and again, it will help activate, further activate these macrophages and then produce many, many much more of, the, of, of these cytokines. And uh, we also know that if animals are on, on high diets, again, again, a lot of this comes from people, but and also birds, that when we have high, high nutrient inputs, okay, uh, that they that in itself because some of those fatty acids and other things are recognized by the immune system as stimuli to actually turn the immune system on. So, again, if we put animals on on a high nutrient intake before they're really ready for it, that too can have a negative effect on the immune system and cause it again to sort of again overreact. And we call all this overreaction we call it a cytokine storm. Okay, so again, it's just. What you see down here at the bottom of the storm, so the tornado, uh, is that you see IL-1, IL-6, um, TNF, all of those pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, that we've talked about um, already. Another you know, area where we, we see this, this cytokine storm occur actually is, again, back to, uh, from a clinical standpoint, is, is in fresh cows, and again, the newly weaned calf, the idea that, that you can get a temperature spike that's just related actually to these cytokines, okay? Uh, and then we know in people that people have been able to show that again, in, again with LPS, with this endotoxin, that you can actually cause respiratory disease directly with that, again, due to these overproduction of these inflammatory cytokines. So that results in, in an acute lung injury. And then there's a condition in uh, feedlot heifers that is called atypical interstitial pneumonia uh, that also looks like some of the conditions that we see in people. So oftentimes, at least in the, in the, in the U.S., what we have done so in, when cows fresh or heifers freshen, uh, and we see these temperatures, our initial thought is it's something infectious. When in fact, what the, the, it may not be something infectious, but rather it's physiological. And so that gets me down to my last point here, is it really, is, is a vaccine going to do me any good? Or in fact, what should I do is manage the inflammation. And that's why I have where I have, you know, is the answer to give them aspirin or some kind of a non-steroidal to help uh, deal with this. So again, it's, again, uh, an issue, both with diet in terms of, of, of if we've got, again, from a, a balancing standpoint that, uh, and, and then a condition, so the condition of the animal, diet together can give us these um, cytokine storms. Plus, certainly pathogens can also contribute to that. We know that influenza in people uh, also turns on a cytokine storm. And this is just showing you uh, in these four sections, actually these are humans that, that died of, a, of respiratory disease, uh, and the, the panels that say A and B on them uh, really represent kind of an acute pneumonia that we see, uh, and that can be seen with these cytokine storms. Uh, or what you see in panels C and D is more a chronic form, and this actually looks more like what we see with atypical interstitial pneumonia. So, again, uh, this is again where with, with either diet and condition together can give us issues in terms of, of respiratory disease. So, these issues that we've really been talking about in these, in these last um, sets of slides really, you know, have to do with with really probably too much innate immunity or not enough innate immunity, depending on how you look at it. And you realize that innate immunity, actually, there's two components. So we've talked a lot about this pro-inflammatory. And then I mentioned the anti-inflammatory when I was talking about eosinophils. And the, and the thing that we understand is, is that, that it's really not one or the other, but rather that the two of them work together. Okay, so it's not a, it's not a balancing act. Like you've got to have, you know, so much pro-inflammatory, and then if the, the, the teeter-totter goes in the wrong direction, uh, then the anti-inflammatory kicks in. So that's, that's not what we're looking at. What we look at is that they work, They may absolutely work separately, and they work together, but not in terms of necessarily opposing each other at all. So let me just talk about each one of those just with a little bit more. We know that the, the pro-inflammatory response is absolutely essential 
for a good vaccine response. Okay, so the recruit cells, uh, that inflammation helps in terms of Im improving uh, antibody production and certainly helps us in terms of developing a better memory response to vaccine. So again, that, that's really important when we talk about this pro-inflammatory. But again, we also know the other side of that is that too much of it uh, can result in, uh, in disease. Now, if we look at the, the, uh, this picture, this is again from Barry Bradford uh, with, the, with the fresh cow, uh, the idea that she's got all these opportunities again for where she can have this inflammatory response. So whether it's from heat stress, uh, it's from some metritis, so again, a localized infection there. It's from LPS. I talked about the idea again with, with the, in the intestinal tract and in oxidative stress and in social stress. So here again, we talked about, you know, fear and flight. Again, so we're mixing cows, um, bringing, you know, fresh cows in, adding them to the, to the other cows that are, that are present in terms of social stress there. And then, you know, then obviously mastitis, another infection. So again, all those things can result in pro inflammatory responses and again, can really have a negative effect on, on that cow. Now, the anti-inflammatory response then, again, it maintains, as we'll talk in a little bit, the, 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 the integrity of the gut so that the gut won't be leaky. It's important particularly for IgA, and we'll talk about IgA is on, uh, certainly in the mucosa, the most important antibody. And it's actually the, the largest antibody or largest amount of antibody in the body is IgA. Uh, and then uh, it also regulates these regulatory cells, which help in, in turn in keeping the intestinal tract and other tissues in, a, in an anti-inflammatory state. So again, so they don't over-respond uh, too much. Now, what can we, what can, are there actually interventions that we can do to try to lessen this innate immune response? And, and the answer is there are. Um, so this is, I mentioned this a little bit already, the fact that non-steroidals such as um, aspirin and meloxicam. Uh, and then we've seen other things that we're, where we've actually gone with Cytokines. So cytokines, again, remember, are the hormones produced by the immune system. Uh, and one of the uh, cytokines that's actually now available commercially is something called uh, Emrister. Uh, and it's a granulite colony stimulating factor, which, again, is there particularly to increase the number of neutrophils. And again, there would be times when that's important and other times that we'd, we might want to avoid that. But certainly for mastitis, it's, a, it would be, you know, it's important that we have more neutrophils there. And then we have other classes that we call uh, immunomodulators, uh, and some of these have been around for a while. So uh, uh, something called immunoboost, and this is, a, a, again, these are typically made out of parts of pathogens or bacteria, and so they'll, have a, have a, they'll stimulate the immune system that way. Uh, so just to take a part of a bacteria or a part of a virus and stimulate the immune system that way, which it normally would. Or the other thing that, you, that you'll see here is you see zelnate, uh, and zelnate is, is also involved with something that stimulates the immune system. In this case, it's uh, uh, a piece of DNA that actually, again, will help turn on, in this case, both the anti-inflammatory and the pro-inflammatory response, and, and it's uh, uh, CPG. So and I think you're going to see more of these types of management strategies to try to keep innate immunity under control because, again, part of it is that we want to have improved growth and efficiency, and, we, and if the innate immune system is being activated, um, there's going to be a, a negative drag on that. So let's talk a little, little bit now about immunity and energy. And, and again, we've alluded to this already when I talked about uh, acute phase proteins, that there's a cost. But there's a cost just to make immune components. So you'll see in this slide, it says the immune system uh, doesn't get a free ride. It's a, it's a major energy consumer. Uh, and again, energy, so I've listed here uh, in kind of a, a hierarchy, so energy being the most important, um, followed by protein, because again, cells are made out of protein, and then the C, vitamin A, D, and E, uh, and then copper, zinc, and selenium, all very important. Those minerals and certainly other minerals are also important uh, when it comes to the immune system, but copper, zinc, and selenium are, are the big ones. Then the other thing is just uh, we don't want to make sure that we don't forget iron. So if we look at an animal, and looking looking at how we're uh, partitioning energy, you see that in the young dairy heifer, they're basically they're doing two things: they're growing, and then they require a certain component for maintenance. So for their heart to beat, their lungs to move, all those kind of things, uh, you know. So that's the simplest kind of energy partition we can have. Then if we vaccinate that animal, there's some cost that occurs 
uh, because of the immune response. Okay, so the immune response uh, has a cost to it, and so that's shown here. So that's going to take away a little bit from growth lean because maintenance is basically always the same. Now, the reason that we vaccinate, though, is because we're trying to avoid this, where we have a large loss because we have to have the, the disease itself cause damage and we have to recover from it. So, again, that has a big, in, a big cost in terms of what it will do to growth and lean. Then when we breed that animal, now we have a, a segment of that energy that's now going to go into reproduction. So, again, that's uh, going to be partitioned away from growth and lean. And then when we get to the prepartum animal, so this is the animal that's now pregnant, now we're trying to help there in terms of the fetal development. So again, there's going to be a partition that's going to occur there. And then when we get to the postpartum animal, okay, so again, looking at, and again, we're here alluding to dairy cows rather than to beef cows, uh, because there's a large cost with lactation. And the thing that I want you to realize, and you'll see this a little bit later in the presentation, is that Lactation almost trumps almost all the other processes. So, for example, lactation trumps uh, immunity, and so that's that's something that we, uh, you know, we need to be aware of is is that indeed uh, that uh, lactation when lacta early in lactation that takes a lot of energy and it'll have a negative effect on, for example, on response to vaccines. Uh, so here you see the prepartum animal, and if we're going to vaccinate, I get the idea that in this case because I don't have lactation going on at that time that maybe that's, you know, from an energy standpoint, maybe a better time to, to do it than, say, in the animal that's actually in the postpartum period uh, who now uh, I'm going to have an effect in terms of, of immunity. And so the immunity itself may be less because lactation is ends up being a, a bigger component. Uh, and then obviously the other thing that's happening here is I'm getting this, this animal ready for the next reproductive cycle as well. Now, uh, Marcus Curley um, at the National Disease Center is, you know, has done a lot of work in terms of or trying to calculate in terms of energy costs. And other people there uh, have also worked on that, um, particularly um, uh, Julie Ridpath and John Neal. And that's what you see in this next slide. It's that they looked at B cells and T cells. So those are the important cells in the acquired immune response, okay, and showed that if you look at the at their um, gene expression in those cells, that they have a high level in things that, are, that have to produce energy. So mitochondrial, energy metabolism, uh, housekeeping genes are all involved. And then you have the things that are specific to um, immune cells themselves, so the receptors and uh, soft surface proteins. But again, all those, those um, things have an energy uh, component. Now, if we look at the other at, at the neutrophils. So now we're talking about the major cell in the innate immune system. Uh, you'll see that again that a large part of its partitioning and of its proteome, uh, looking at the proteins there, and it has to do with metabolism or with the ability of these cells to move. Okay, and then these are immune specific um, things, but, but you'll see that you know over half of, the, of their energy uh, consumption is in metabolism and cell mobility. So again, uh, when they're when they're turned on. Um, that's that's where that energy is going is to get these cells um, highly active and then be able to move where they need to go. So Marcus did um, some calculations and figuring that in a, in a cow uh, that the new this is PMN stands for neutrophils um, that a cow makes a lot of neutrophils in a, in a day. Okay, 3.3 times 10 to the 11th, and then measuring figuring out how much tissue is involved that um, that two, that just to replace neutrophils to take 2%, 2.6% of the daily net energy. And then, uh, and these are like activities that we already talked about. So the surveillance is part of movement, migration, uh, and then we know that their products, okay, so this is back to acute phase proteins, and all those things can uh, raise the basic metabolic rate because of the febrile response and the increased catabolism of protein. So again, that's back to uh, um, what the effect it has on the liver. So again, all these things decrease in the efficiency of that animal's productivity. So uh, again, and this is again from, from Marcus's work or, and review that he's done, is that again, that uh, if you look at animals that are diseased, okay, so he's looking here at chickens, uh, you can see that if, you, if, 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 the, if poultry is, is infected with salmonella, that normally so the 2.2% of lysine that goes to immune function, almost there's a, over, four, over a full fold increase that now goes, now because of it, again, back to the idea of an animal's disease, 
that you've got to be able to, uh, you know, that protein's got to come from someplace. And so often, in this case, it comes from catabolism. And we know in people that if they have sepsis, so again, it's going to be a bacterial infection, that the resting energy is increased by 40% above normal, okay, and it remains elevated, and that patients can lose up to 13% of their total body protein. So again, you have muscle wasting. The unfortunate thing, though, is that there's little to no um, published work uh, in cattle right now. But Marcus did do some, you know, some estimating, okay, and that the maintenance energy for a 600 kilogram dairy cow is 9.7 uh, megacalories. And if you increase energy expenditure, this is back to this, back from what we know in people, 40% to my uh, an inflammatory response that you need to have another four megacalories. Okay, well we know those cows aren't going to eat that much more, so it's got to come from somewhere else. So Again, they're not going to you know be able to consume that much more, so they're going to have to you know catabolize it from existing tissue. So I, I think I, to me it's always been an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon. All right, so let's look at now. If let's turn away from energy and talk about um, some specific components, and I'm just going to touch on just a few here. So let's begin with looking at vitamin A. So vitamin A uh, is as far as the immune system is concerned, has a really important effect, and that is in helping traffic lymphocytes to be coastal surfaces. So uh, if you look uh, in the diagram down below, you'll see where I have the arrow. Uh, that's actually, that would be um, the epithelium of the intestinal tract. Uh, and the idea then that, that cells need to move into that area. Uh, and when they move into that area, then they uh, produce proteins and antibodies locally to help protect the intestinal tract. So that movement is really important, and that's what really they're showing here with, with this, this box is the importance that vitamin A has to help T cells and B cells move uh, into lymphoid follicles and help protect the intestinal tract. So in the in the, okay, uh, um, <laughs> Chris, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Okay. This is where I need to load the video and give my co-hosts an opportunity to do that as well. Okay. So I'm going to take back over and because I can't do it unless I'm in charge. Okay. And then we will load up that first video. So bear with us. So what you're seeing here is actually uh, the endothelium uh, in the intestinal tract. And what you'll see the, the red cells moving are actually the T cells being actually recruited in. And, uh, and, and you'll see uh, in the middle, and then uh, the panel to the left, uh, just a blow up of that. So you can actually see the cells migrate then from the vessels into the tissue. And again, that's what they need to do to really get that local immune response to, to do what it's doing uh, in the intestinal tract. So again, you can uh, watch that one more time. And now you see the close up on the left hand side of that panel uh, and actually watch them move in uh, into the tissue. Uh, and then they'll seed themselves in the intestinal tract. The, the second component I just wanted to, to speak about briefly in terms of, of, of specific nutrients is zinc, uh, because zinc is important for a number of things when it comes to innate immunity, uh, the antioxidant enzymes, particularly in macrophages and neutrophils, and we know that uh, inflammation will decrease because you'll have less IL-6 with lower zinc and we know, again, looking at the adaptive immune response, that zinc really increases IgG and IgM. Uh, and then we know that zinc deficiency uh, will result in, in decreased lymphoid organ size, less T cell responses, and reduced NK activity. So zinc really has a, has a lot of uh, effects. Uh, and then we also know that when it comes to inflammation, that that has uh, a, a big effect on the zinc pool in terms of inflammation seems to really cause an increase in terms of zinc. I mean, the, it's like the, you know, the, the body uh, is trying to mobilize zinc, and so we actually have a tendency to lose more zinc on uh, an inflammatory response, uh, particularly in the urine. So again, it's, it's a highly regulated system, but again, you can see that here's those inflammatory cytokines affecting that zinc pool, pool and reducing uh, its availability, and therefore all the positive effects that we talked about zinc, if we have you know, decreased zinc, uh, there's gonna be less of that. And then finally, the last thing that I want to talk about in terms of specific nutrients is vitamin E and selenium. So again, they're a potent antioxidant, and we know that vitamin E uh, enhances T cell and B cells to grow, uh, NK cells uh, to be active. Again, we talked about that connection. 
and then phagocytic activity, so that's again the ability of neutrophils and other cells to kill bacteria. We know selenium enhances um, antibody production, uh, enhances uh, chemotaxis, that's the ability of cells to move to where they need to be. Uh, and it also increases um, cytotoxic T cells, which is important for viral infections. So again, very positive effects that vitamin E and selenium have. All right, so just to summarize then on this section on, on, on nutrition is that energy is important for that immune response. Um, vitamin A uh, decreases mucosal homing. Uh, zinc is certainly important at times of stress, and, and particularly, I mean, if we're, when we need to have the native immune system functioning well, it can really have a negative effect on that, and vitamin E and selenium also um, are important, as you said, for, and for a variety of different effects. All right, so the next section I just want to turn to is what is actually now looking at the intestinal tract and its importance to immunity. And so uh, this is a, a, a slide I got from Mike Kogat, um, and he says, uh, what is gut health? And again, you ask 100 people, you probably get 100 answers, and it's kind of a famous uh, Supreme Court case in the United States when they talked about obscenity. Uh, and it says, I know it when I see it. So again, it's kind of a, up to the, the individual to say, okay, what is gut health? So I want to talk to you in the vein of, of what kind of what our uh, understanding is now. So as I said, uh, when we talked about the gut, for one, first of all, it's the largest uh, interface between the external environment and the internal. Uh, it's a major barrier, of which obviously molecules can be absorbed or secreted, but this is the point the next point, the point I want to make is that it's the largest resident immune cells in the body, okay? And so it's not just about the physical barrier, but the immune barrier itself. And that physical barrier, as we'll talk about, is also regulated by the immune system. And then finally, on this slide, it's, it's, it's this interaction that's going to occur between these epithelial cells of the intestinal tract and the microbes that regulates the, the gut and actually the immune responses. And there, again, uh, we look at a GI system. I mean, these are the normal things that we would think of as digestive and food absorption. That's the first thing that we think of. But this microbial population is really important, as we'll show you in just a couple slides, in terms of helping, in terms of keeping that immune cells effective, and also in terms of keeping the gut barrier uh, intact. And again, it's all back to what we said before, this interaction that occurs in with the neuroendocrine system. Again, when we think of, of, the, of the body as, a, as this PVC pipe, this plastic tube, uh, so the food is digested within the hull, okay, uh, but it never actually enters into the solid um, plastic material. Uh, so the tube is the inner, the inner surface of the digestive system. The outer system, again, so also it's interacting with this microbiome, uh, is, is uh, in the skin and that's interacting. And the only part that's actually uh, the body itself is just that part of the plastic tube there. So again, we got surrounded internally and externally by these, this microbiome. Now, as I said, these bacteria, viruses, and fungi that are actually uh, in this microbiome, mo the vast majority of them are commensals and they're good, and they're there to actually enhance the barrier, enhance immunity. So we know that uh, parts of gram-positive bacteria, the peptidoglycans, is essential for immune follicle development and expression of something that we'll, I'll show you in the, in the next little movie called defenses or microbial peptides. We know that different pieces, so that we talked about peptidoglycans being one piece, there's a, a bacteria fragilis have a, have a, uh, a polysaccharide on their surface that affects the regulatory cells. So these are just all examples of different pieces. So here's a, uh, another bacteria which um, induces uh, uh, antibacterial peptides uh, and then it reduces the, the, the ability of bacteria to grow. And again, these are all components that are actually part of bacteria that are, that are in that microbiome. And then finally, we know that micro, the micro uh, mucus is induced by the microbiome itself, that uh, it will increase the mucus and actually also increase the amount of IgA that's there. Here's just another example, uh, something called um, Candida uh, salvagia. It's a segmented bacteria, and it stimulates IgA production uh, and also uh, 
produces, causes cells to produce more of these antibacterial peptides. And then finally, the last example I have here is clostridial species, and typically we think of them as actually bad, but we've been to understand that they produce these short-chain fatty acids that cause the cells to produce um, TGF-beta, and that why that's important is it helps maintain intestinal integrity and also produce IgA. So the next cartoon kind of puts these different components together. So again, here is that microbiome, and as you can see, different products that are coming from it, and basically what they're doing is they're enhancing this barrier, okay, so either by making more mucus or the production of uh, antimicrobial peptides or regulating the immune system so that the immune system produces um, more IgA and has what we call this gut immune homeostasis and keeps it from overreacting. And that's really important when we're talking about uh, the intestinal tract. Here's another cartoon, and this is looking uh, at how these commensal bacteria, so in this case, it's metabolites they produce. So the other examples that we were looking at for, for the most part was actually portions of these bacteria or fungi that have an effect, but here we're looking actually at their ability to break down um, nutrients into short-chain fatty acids, uh, such as butyrate, and that the, the effect that that has on, this is again the intestinal epithelial cells of the intestine. So it causes them again to um, be what we call anti-inflammatory. So it, it increases, uh, causes T cells to help give help to produce more IgA. Again, that's the secretory antibody that helps protect the intestinal tract. And at the same time, it suppresses excessive immune response and so that we don't have uh, leaky gut, we don't have other things that are going to have a, a negative effect on them. And the other thing, uh, so again, this anti-inflammatory response is key uh, for the healthy mucosa. Now, on this next slide, we, we're contrasting what happens in a healthy, with a healthy microbiota, and you can see what it does, that you have thicker mucus, You've got more uh, cells here that are, that are interacting. You see more IgA here, uh, little round dots of these antimicrobial peptides. And so there's a, a, a stronger barrier, okay, a thicker barrier, and I call this actually the kill zone. Okay? This, this zone here is much thicker okay? compared to over here where the, where the microbiome has been depleted. So it could be um, because we've had a feed change. It could be from the use of some, certain types of antibiotics. And here what you see then you see more inflamed cells, and again, the idea that that gut is going to have a tendency to, to actually be much more leaky. Now, we're going to change now to um, actually another movie, and this is a movie that actually is based on um, Crohn's disease, so I'll stop. All right, so what we're looking at here then is the intestine, and unfortunately, I can't show you. Tell me where you want me to point. Okay, well, I, so here are the epi so the gray guy is the epithelial cells, so if you can point at them, that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if I can do that. Yeah, and then and, yeah, and then the and then the red things are the tight junctions, and they're um, regulated by the immune system. Okay. And then you see the yellow cells, the kind of the round ones are called goblet cells, and they're producing mucus. And you're actually going to see them do that right now. So you're going to see that mucus, and that forms part of what I call this kill zone. Uh, so there's the mucus layer, and it's again produced by cells that are part of the epithelium. And then that yellow cell in the middle. Okay, there's a yellow cell with little spots in it. It produces um, antimicrobial peptides. And it turns out that in cattle and in hogs, it turns out that all the epithelial cells produce that. But again, those are like nature's natural antibiotic that helps in terms of being able to uh, make, so the, there's a physical barrier of the mucus plus the antimicrobial peptides and IgA then form that kill zone to help keep bacteria from invading. So now what we're seeing is we're seeing a dendritic cell. And this is a cell that the body uses to actually grab antigens and to be able to turn on the acquired immune system. So what you're going to see here is it's interacting with the T cell. And because of the environment from the uh, microbes that are here in that TGF beta and IL-10, what this T cell is, is it's a regulatory T cell that actually will induce IgA. And so here you see a B cell. It's getting the signals because of, the, of how it's been activated to produce IgA. And then you'll see IgA get exported and go into that kill zone. That's, uh, so and again, in this case, you see them actually uh, killing bacteria. Now you're going to see another, uh, the dendritic cell, again, grab some antigen, and this time it's going to interact with a natural killer cell that we talked about uh, a couple times today. 
Uh, and what that does is, is it's going to send signals to that natural killer cell, which is going to then send signals to the epithelium now to produce more antimicrobial peptides. And so you're going to see more of them released, and again, enhancing the kill zone so bacteria can invade. What we're going to see is we're going to see we're going to see a blow up of one of, of that uh, uh, cell that's producing the antimicrobial peptides here. Uh, so they're going to and what they're going to show us is that there's actually uh, that little thing that looks like a question mark uh, is a receptor and and normally it's sensing bacterial products. And when it does that, then what it does is it goes into to the cell, so it's sensing the products that are out there, so products that we talked about already. And then it causes those genes to produce more of the antimicrobial peptides, and now we have increased the kill zone. And what we know that is in, in some people have Crohn's disease, okay, they, they actually have a deficiency uh, in some of these receptors. So they're going to zoom in on this cell in just a, a, a second. And what we're going to see this time when they zoom in on it, is that there's actually going to be uh, the receptor's got kind of like a little kink in it. So instead of being that question mark, it's kind of closed, and now it can interact with those um, anti the, the small uh, uh, microbial components that was interacting with. It. Then it can't enhance the production of antimicrobial peptides. And when that happens, then that kill zone, which can see again consists of mucus. Uh, and antimicrobial peptides and IgA will actually decrease. So you'll see it kind of shrink here, and now bacteria can get inside, and now this is where we get into a big problem. This is if we, where we get uh, the syndrome known as, as leaky gut. I'll show you that in the next slide as well. And so now when the bacteria cross over, the immune system, the native immune system responds to it to eliminate it. And so what you're going to see is here comes the macrophage, a very potent cell to activate things. It's going to recruit in lots of other cells whose job it is is to remove this. But in the course of doing that, it damages the epithelium, it breaks down those red tight junctions, and now the gut becomes even leakier. Okay, so that's what we're trying to minimize that. Uh, so again, so that's gonna require that we have good, uh, good commensals, we have good microbiota, and we have a healthy epithelium. And if we do that, then the animal is gonna be in much better shape in terms of, it, of its growth and lean. So again, that's a, a key part of this. And this Again, this one is actually from Janeway's Immunobiology. Uh, and if you go actually on YouTube and put in Garland Science, you can actually um, see that movie there as well. What we're seeing here, again, this is, this is looking at, again, here's the intestinal cells. Here's where the microbiome is. And so once that inflammatory response starts to occur, these inflammatory cells produce tumor necrosis factor. Okay, so you see that being produced right here. And what tumor necrosis factor does is it actually goes into those epithelial cells and it breaks down the tight junctions. And so now the tight junctions become leaky and now I get more bacteria and more products there. And now the immune system responds to that again and it, and it ends up causing more damage. So what I'm trying to do then, again, with, with, with what I'm doing in my microbiome and what I'm doing with my epithelial cells is to, is to minimize that. So the gut isn't leaky, uh, so it will not have an inflammatory response uh, and so that will absorb and secrete like it's supposed to uh, and, and, and move on. So the other thing I want to remind you about when it comes to microflora and diet is that, you know, usually when we talk about nutrition, what we're talking about is that it's just feeding the animal. But, but I want you to realize because you've got this huge giant organism that's the microbiome that you're also feeding that as well. Uh, and we know that those bacteria you know, produce uh, vitamins and the uh, microbiome does. The other thing that we know, though, and we've learned this from people, is that, um, that in fact, some of these bacteria are more efficient and that, that people that are obese, one of the things that they have is their microbiome uh, has more efficient bacteria. So that's why they are more, quote, unquote, efficient at what they do and, and more likely to be obese. So the takeaways then from... Uh, the microbiome is that it needs to be managed and not upset. Okay, so again, so things like diet, dehydration, uh, the amount of feed intakes, the types of feed intakes will all affect that. And this brings up kind of the, the, an interesting question in terms of 
of prebiotics and probiotics. Because if you think about um, prebiotics, again, typically we're talking about um, yeast or bacteria or whatever, where uh, it's not a live organism. So that case would be, we talked about components. We saw that components are important for uh, intestinal health. And then we know with probiotics that the idea of breaking down and producing metabolites is also important. But the, the, the question is, where do they fit in? And, and again, I mean, I, and I think they are good for gut health, but the problem that we have is how do we measure it and do we need them all the time? And I think, again, we're back to what I start out with was stress, that probably at times the stress, and again, as we begin to understand more about the mechanism, then I think we'll be able to be able to be maybe more timely about when we can use them and, and how often we can use them. All right, so I'm going to uh, finish up here. With, i got just a few slides, and so we're back to, and I, I just want to make this point about in the fresh cow, because at least in the U.S., we have a lot of, of, of our therapy, vaccination, and other things is aimed at that cow when she's fresh. And, and again, what, what I want to make clear, that was certainly within that first three or four weeks after she freshens of early lactation, her ability to respond immunologically uh, isn't that isn't all that great? We know, if, as I showed you this before, we've got a lot of things going on here. But uh, there's a, a sort of a classic experiment that I want to just show you here in the last few slides. So again, we know that if you look at these cows after they've freshened, that they're again, you typically they're going to have more mastitis, uh, they're going to have more other infectious disease, and that they're that they're around the time of calving that their innate functions are uh, greatly diminished. So let me show you, this is an experiment that was done again, Marcus Curley and his group, where they took Jersey cows and they, either, and so these are, as you can see, a cow with a full udder, or they performed a mastectomy. So that cow no longer has an udder, okay? Uh, it's done to them as heifers before their udders ever developed. And so what they wanted to do is determine what's the effect that just lactation has on immune response. So I'm just gonna show you one slide. Uh, and this is a slide, so that in this case, the yellow, is that cows that had mastectomy. So you can see prior to the time of calving, they were very similar. Okay, so now they calf, and now what you'll see is that the animal that's not lactating, her immune system comes right back up, okay? Uh, the acquired immune system is similar, although the acquired immune system actually comes up a little bit faster in the cow uh, that, that's, that's intact, that's actually lactating. But again, my point here is again, is that lactation really has a major effect on immunity. Uh, then I want to just talk about this, this last study. This is a study that we actually did at South Dakota State. Uh, it was a, a Latin square. We wanted to look at the fact that uh, acidogenic diets uh, and uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate had on, on the immune response. And we did this at Holstein Steers. Uh, we published this uh, a few years back. And so this was, so basically it's the same animals were exposed to the control diet, uh, anionic salt, uh, butylene glycol, uh, or um, high grain. So again, in, in corn. So these are the diets that we gave. So there's four month old steer calves. Uh, we vaccinated them, and then we looked at their immune response. Uh, and what we saw, first of all, is that we looked at the blood pH of these animals, that not surprisingly, that the animals that were on the uh, high grain um, had a little lower pH, and the anionic salt had a lower pH, uh, and uh, there's butylene glycol. Uh, and then what we did is we looked to see how what was their immune response. Again, remember they've already been primed. And the interesting thing we saw that their overall immune response, which is what you see under SEB, um, decreased uh, over the control animals. So that this is just their overall response, immune response in this. But the most interesting thing was was the effect that it had on uh, bovine bile diarrhea virus. So these are cattle that already had memory. So what this is saying is that when they were, had these uh, acidogenic diets, that they actually had less memory response in the control animals. And we saw the same thing, again, they're, they're their own control with IBR, with the bovine herpes virus. So again, this, again that if we're looking at you know, subacute acidosis uh, and those things that occur early in lactation or some of the other uh, treatments that we use uh, in early lactation, that's gonna have an effect on, on vaccination. All right, so again, so my, my takeaways here, the fresh cows are poor vaccine candidates, uh, lactation trumps immunity, and that acidosis too can affect memory. So uh, just a couple things that, you know, when we, again, I'm, a, you know, I'm an immunologist, uh, veterinarian, but uh, we know that, uh, again, when we 
trying to vaccinate animals, particularly weaned animals, there's lots of stressors going on. So you've got uh, the, the uh, immunosuppression, acidosis, uh, and then uh, something that we didn't talk about, but that that we have to be aware of is that if an animal is well vaccinated um, and there's already pre-existing immunity, and then I give it a live organism, how good of a response will I get? Because the immune system doesn't know the difference between a vaccine virus and a virus that's in the field. So that's one of the, one of the things that, that, we're, that we're aware of. And then when it comes to the best time, just the idea that, again, that probably in that first 21 days of lactation is not a good time. I think the dry period is a, is a better time. Uh, and then in, an issue that we have, uh, I would just say in the U.S., when it comes to vaccination, particularly when we talk about calves, uh, is that we often vaccinate them uh, too much and too soon. Uh, and I mentioned the idea that, that you have to have an inflammatory response to get a really good immune response. So, you know, often people get concerned when they give a vaccine. And again, I don't want animals to be very sick, but you'll see maybe for one feeding, they won't eat as much or they'll lay down more after you vaccinate. And if you've ever had the vaccine, you know how your arm feels. So again, that tells us if that's happening, that the vaccine's working. And so that's why I say here, we vaccinate and we see nothing and probably nothing happened in terms of that immune response. Uh, another thing that we know is that typically we've often, you know, boosted at very short intervals and people are concerned if I, don't, you know, if I miss that 21 days, you know, did I waste the first vaccine? And I would say in most cases not, but uh, it does depend on the vaccine. And then the other thing that we know, and again, we didn't talk about this today, but that we know that, that again, that the immune system takes some time to develop that acquired immune response. So if we're trying to get a good booster response, that might take a, it takes a little bit longer, often at least 30 days. Uh, and so if we do it shorter thinking that we're boosting, uh, we probably aren't. And that's my last slide. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to take control back. Um, that was really good. That was very interesting. Um, hopefully we'll have some good questions. Um, if you're in the audience and you do have questions, please enter them in the chat window or in the question and answer tab. We'll alternate questions from the different countries and then we'll, we'll get to everybody's questions. So go ahead and type them in either the question and answer or in the chat window and I'll read them. First, I need to take care of a few other details. Let's just, I want you all to join me next month for Dr. Laura Hernandez. She's an associate professor at the Dairy Science Department of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her talk will be the first in a series of presentations focused on transition period nutrition. And I don't think Dr. Chase could have done a better job of sort of leading into a discussion of how important transition is. Her area of research has been focused on serotonin and calcium homeostasis. The transition period obviously sets, up, sets us up for everything that happens or doesn't happen in the lactation. So please be sure to join us next month on March 14th at 6 p.m. And for those of you joining in the English language, we switch around times a little bit because we deal with daylight saving time. Argentina doesn't, and that's what we use as our standard. Everybody stays on the same time in Argentina, and we bump back and forth on those first and last webinars. I want to thank my partners in this venture. We have many people that are working on this webinar, and we have four individuals who are my co-hosts. So we have um, the staff of AMTS, USA and Global, Marcelo Hens Ramos from 3R Lab in Brazil, Paula Torillo in Argentina, and Tom Long joins us this year. He's from Hemingway in China. We also obviously have some, we need to have some generous sponsors that help us make this possible. Firstly, I'd like to thank our gold sponsors, Ajinomoto Heartland, the makers of Agipro L, their superior nutrition through amino acid, and Arm & Hammer Animal Health, makers of cattle feed ingredients that optimize dairy cow health. Our silver sponsors are Dairyland Laboratories, Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s, Cumberland Valley Analytical Services, Kemen, featuring USA Lysine, Dairy One Forage Laboratory, R&D Life Sciences, and AB Vista. Our bronze sponsors are AminoMax, 
Purdue Agribusiness, Jeffo, Quality Liquid Feeds, Adiseo, and Origination, Inc. Thanks, everybody, and here we go. Dr. Chase, you're back on. Paula, would you yes. like to lead us off, or do you are you busy translating? No, I have a couple of questions if you want me to start. Yes, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chase. It was a great presentation. I have uh, two questions to start with. Uh, one is from Marta. As you told us the importance of vitamin A, zinc, selenium, and vitamin E on immune response, what would be your suggestion in terms of how and when we should administer them in bovine to be effective? Well, that's, that's, that's a really good question. I, 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 would, I would say uh, when it comes to um, all of those, I mean, they're, they're all essential to, um, to calf health. So I, I would want to uh, make sure that uh, you know, when those calves hit the ground that we, um, what we've done, to, and, and I, think, I think one of the things that we have begun to understand a lot is that what happens in gestation uh, really, um, so so it really starts out that I've got that that cow um, as she's in gestation. That I made sure that she's um, got the proper levels of of you know, and, and, and copper as well, um, and so that as because those components that are developing in that calf need to have those uh, um, nutrients present while that calf is developing. So that's so it's really key during gestation and then when, once that calf hits the ground and no longer dependent on on maternal sources um, and it gets its own acquired immune response you know those those same nutrients have, we got to make sure that they're at a good level there because really immune development uh, it starts at about um, 30 to 60 days of gestation um, in a calf it's sort of maximal in terms of all the pieces are there by the time they're at 150 days of gestation, and then from there on out, it's a matter of just increasing the numbers. Uh, and then once the calf is born, so the components are all there, they just don't work quite as well as they should yet. So again, then that's why that's another critical period to make sure that we've got um, those nutrients. And then, and you know, it's certainly, you know, we need we need them at other stages of life. But I think you know those are two critical places where uh, because because if that calf doesn't develop with the right environment, I, I can't ever, I can never make that up. Uh, I mean, I can give all the vitamin A or the selenium I want to that calf once it's born, but in fact, if if those nutrients weren't there during development, as far as the immune system is gone is concerned, there's always going to be probably some deficiency. So uh, it begins in gestation and in, in, into that uh, development. Because usually, I think we think in cases that typically, even though the components don't work all that good by the time we get to three to four months of age, so after they've been uh, on, you know, on the ground for 90 to 120 days, that probably, I mean, they're not quite to an adult stage, but by the time they get to 90 to 120 days, their immune system is pretty well, you know, where it's going to be. They'll be they'll get a little bit better in some things, but those will be critical areas, critical times to make sure we're doing a good job. Okay, and the other one is uh, related with this. Uh, in a case where you have ill or unhealthy animals, would you overdosify those nutrients? Uh, so, so that's a good question. The answer is yes. Um, probably, probably the one that we have seen, interestingly enough, I, that I think particularly in young calves that we've seen an issue with is probably copper um, because it's, uh, you know, everybody with their supplements or their other things, they're going to add a little more copper. What we've seen is a cumulative effect of that. So you certainly can, and certainly we have um, in the U.S. where we're in Western, where in the state I live in, uh, where we have excessive amounts of selenium, um, there's certainly, there, there's issues there. Uh, vitamin E, because vitamin E and selenium are related, um, they're, they're certainly, you don't see as much toxicosis with vitamin E as you do with, from selenium. But yeah, you certainly you, you certainly can have, and, and, and with zinc, um, hyperkeratosis and some other things that, that can occur if you give them too much. So it's really important when you have multiple sources and where everyone's saying, well, I'm going to increase this uh, m micro mineral in particular, um, that you, you know, kind of see what the total is. Because again, what we've seen in the U.S., particularly in calves, 
um, is that you know, people, everybody's been adding a little bit more copper, and we've seen some issues with copper toxicity uh, in those in those in calves, which then again will cause kind of a long-term burnout, uh, and they won't you know they won't perform the way that you want them to. Okay, so my question actually is from from Vahid, and he says, first of all, thank you for a great webinar. And do you have any experience or trials with essential oils and immunity? Well, so that, it's interesting that you'd ask her that question. The answer is yes. Um, we actually published a paper last year uh, in young calves uh, looking at uh, essential oils. So we published that in uh, the Journal of Animal Science. Uh, in, so this is a case where essential oils included in uh, both milk replacer and in the uh, in the creep feed in, in in that study that we published, uh, we showed um, improved immune uh, function in those calves. We were measuring uh, secretory IgA, so we were measuring IgA, and then we also measured um, IgG, and then obviously we looked at production parameters. Um, I will say that in that particular study, that there wasn't a tr a, a tremendous um, disease. Um, challenge in those calves, but there was certainly there was an, a definite advantage to the animals that got uh, in that particular study that that got essential oils. Um, I mean, it's a real, it's a a very interesting area. And again, again, as we get better techniques to measure that, I think we, we can kind of again figure out best times to use that. But but we we have, uh, like I said, we we published a paper last year looking at essential oils. Okay, thank you. I think I'm going to look for that. And if people are interested, just email me and I will um, send, send a link to it. My next question is from Nicholas Arias. It is well known that yeast walls can help to improve innate immune in the gut. Does it have an effect in the innate immune system, uh, immune immunity at a systemic level, or is it only in the gut? So, uh, Hello, Nicholas, because I uh, Nicholas is my former graduate student. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so the so the answer is is the effect is local, but uh, what, what you have to realize is is when we say that it's local, that if I enhance uh, the you know intestinal barrier and I can uh, have my have the mucus layer be thicker and I have less LPS coming across. Then, the, because the LPS effect is systemic. In other words, by enhancing the barrier and enhancing the um, uh, the health of the epithelial cells, I am also protecting against the, a systemic effect. So, so the effect is at at that. It's a very local effect, but it's a very local effect that if, if it's not in uh, uh, at a one shape, I'm going to have a systemic effect and see that cytokine storm. So, so it is, even though it's like I said, it's local, but but it, it's so so much bigger than that. Um, that if that barrier is breached, you're going to have a tremendous amount of systemic inflammation that will be the result of that poor that barrier def deficit. One. Uh, no, yes, I can. Okay. Very good. Uh, okay, uh, the question is from Pedro. You showed us an increment in eosinophil in calves. Could it be related with parasites? Uh, so, so that's a, that's a really good question. So, so <laughs> there, there's actually been some work done. Uh, well, there's been a number, of, a fair amount of work done actually in people, uh, where they actually intentionally parasitize people uh, that have inflammatory disease issues. In other words, they're, they're they have a um, either. Uh, a congenital or some acquired disease where they have more inflammation. So I mean Crohn's disease being one, and they've actually shown that you know, and it, and it seems kind of far-fetched, but um, they've used whipworms, they've used hookworms. They've actually done that and actually shown improvement because as you decrease the inflammatory response uh, by the induction of eosinophils, there's a there's a positive effect in terms of health. There's also been some work that's been done, um, and, and so this, again, this kind of goes against what the management practice is. But um, I, when when I first looked at the study that um, John Richardson did, which showed that there was a positive correlation between the presence of eosinophils and less bovine respiratory disease, that I I talked to uh, some representatives for a company that I knew, and, and they had just done a study where 
they actually um, they vaccinated cattle and they gave them an anti-helminthic, so eliminating parasites. And, and what they found was that uh, when they went back and looked at the data, that actually the animals that had the decreased parasite load actually had more respiratory disease. So they actually had more inflammation. So, but it turns out that that really when I'm when I'm talking about um, eosinophils here, it's really not at a at a level typically that we see with parasitemia, but but it's a really interesting question that. Um, you know, maybe there's a there's a point obviously where where parasite load is 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 going to be very harmful, uh, just because of, of the energy that you're losing and the other damage that's occurring. But there also seems to be kind of a a level where that's actually is is a positive effect. And then uh, typically what I was talking about before, these are animals when we said that the eosinophil level was higher, the, the they were their, the parasite load is, was really pretty low on those animals. So that's sort of a kind of a natural part of that. But but the, but it's really intriguing about this concept that eosinophils have this sparing effect in terms of of causing or of decreasing inflammatory disease and and the associated things like BRD and uh, leaky gut and some other things. So it's a it's a, it's, a, it's it's very interesting. I mean I mean obviously <laughs> anti companies that sell parasiticides. Um, are not really excited about that, but it, but I think it's 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 worth looking at. Okay, great. Uh, I have another question from Leo. In Argentina, we don't have live viruses vaccines for respiratory diseases. In your opinion, are dead vaccines effective? So, so good, it's a good question. So, what, you know, what my what I would tell you, my experience has been it really de it depends on the adjuvant that's with the vaccine. So, it's, so I mean, obviously, you've got to have the the viral antigens or the bacterial antigens that you're using. Um, but the the key component really ends up being the adjuvant. And I think you know we've certainly <coughs> excuse me we've certainly published studies. Uh, showing excellent production with inactivated vaccines, but I would certainly tell you that there is certainly, I, I can tell you that uh, inactivated vaccines that we use back in the 90s in terms of the protection that we saw was much less. And then, it, you know, it depends on the disease syndrome you're looking at. So I think I think for respiratory disease, if they're well adjuvanted, I think they, they, do, they offer uh, a, a, a good approach. I think if you're looking at reproductive diseases, um, like uh, protecting against BVD, PI, and some other things that they probably, the evidence would indicate that that you need to probably boost uh, with a modified live. At least this is what we've seen in the U.S. where we can do this. Um, but but even if it's just an inactivated vaccine by itself, it still has shown um, you know a higher, a much higher level of protection than not. So. Um, I, I think uh, on certain things, I think they, there is an equal with modified live. I think in other cases, maybe not quite as good, but again, the adjuvant is really the key to um, how effective they are. Obviously, they have to have the right antigen in there as well, but, but what I've seen is that as we've gotten better adjuvants, and, and that's really been the result of, to be quite honest with you, um, uh, adjuvant research that was done for HIV, okay, so for uh, AIDS, um, we're in, in the human population, we're very limited about adjuvants that we can use, but we learned a lot that was then translated over into livestock, and we've been able to use those. So I think um, what's, what we've seen is over time, we've gotten the inactivated or the kill vaccines have gotten better and better, and I think a lot of that has to do with the adjuvants that we use. Perfect. Um, the last one is from Pedro. When you talk about the cytokine storm when feeding concentrate, provoking an increase of gram-negative bacteria, is the type of starch important? Well, I, I will now tell you that you're in, a, in an area that uh, I, I, it's not my expertise. If Derek Brake from South Dakota State was here, he, he's a starch guy. But, but I mean, I, I think the answer is, I think is yes. I mean, and I'm just speculating. I don't have, I don't have the the evidence from you just because I would think that different different types of starches in terms of how uh, you know how certain species of bacteria would feed on that or would 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 be able to either grow or be inhibited by that would make a big difference and so I, I, I do think that that would but I don't I can't show you the a piece of evidence in front of me right now uh, but I would speculate that 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 starch source certainly will affect microbial populations in different ways 
I have a question from Carl Cass. Is there a good way to check the immune system level or the inflammation level on the farm? So one thing that we have been doing um, that's been interesting to look at is, is um, and we've been doing this predominantly in, in so in dairy herds and, and lactation, and that's just doing something as simple um, as, a, as a CBC, um, so a complete blood count. So looking at white blood cells, doing differentials, uh, because what we've seen is that herds that seem to have under a lot more inflammatory issues have higher neutrophil counts and they have, and interestingly enough, the immune system then has tried to increase the number of eosinophils. And then we've seen where some kind of corrective activity has been done in those herds and what we'll see is those neutrophils, instead of being 50 or 60%, uh, they're back down to, to 30 to 40%, which is where they're supposed to be. Uh, and that eosinophils are practically down nothing. So, and that was something, again, that came from that Richardson study where that, that was the only thing that they looked at was they looked, they took a single blood sample, and these were high risk cattle, but cattle coming into the feed yard took a single blood sample and then looked at that as a predictor of whether or not cattle would, you know, after they developed bovine respiratory disease, they went back and looked at it and see what they could correlate. And, and so one of the things that they correlated was dehydration. And, and that's just, if you look at what the packed cell volume is in an animal, um, that will tell you they'll tell you what, how hydrated or dehydrated they are. And then they, then they looked at the individual differentials and then they, what they, in that study they saw the correlation was the eosinophils. But we've seen, like I said, I've seen in herds that they're under stress. Um, that in, 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 So production is down in these herds. They've got other issues, um, increased milk fever, other things. Uh, we've, so typically what we, we have seen, so, so something as simple as a, as a CBC and white blood cell count, um, have given us some good information. So um, I think, you know, uh, and on the hog side, people have looked at um, using acute phase proteins as a way to look at in, a, in, in production settings uh, where they have higher levels of certain acute phase proteins and they can tie that directly back to productivity. That if, it, if they're high in that, that you can guess that their rate of gain is going to de be decreased. So that's another way that they've been used. That's, I, you know, I, certainly there's the, the group that was at Oregon State now or at um, Texas A&M has, has spent a lot of time looking at acute phase proteins and their effect on, on, on productivity in cattle, um, but not quite to the same level that they have in pigs where they've really shown a very tight correlation between certain types of acute phase proteins and productivity in the animal. Okay, I, I have a question from Tom Long in China. He says, um, for aspirin use, how should we use it to improve immunity, and and how would we do that? How what how what how would you attend to that? Well, so, so this is another place that you might this might be a, a paper that you might that you might want to look for is is that Barry Bradford at um, Kansas State did did a study where he actually put um, and I can't remember it's it's important on the type of aspirin so it's, I always get salicylic acid and acetylsalicylic acid mixed up but but uh he actually put that in into the water for cows and he got, obviously there's a pile issue there too but he did that like for seven days after they freshened and he could show that um in in, in cows that he saw and, and it was a uh, it was by age but what he saw improvement he saw less mastitis he saw less metritis but they're basically are using that right at the time of the stressor and and i know that in canada um where meloxicam is is can be used in cattle, that there's there's certainly our feed yards there that literally when cattle come in, so again with this idea that all these stressors that we talked about are affecting inflammatory responses, that they will actually um, begin them on on meloxicam uh, right off the bat to you know to decrease that inflammation because because I mean, the inflammation is always the you know the worst when you have cumulative things. So if you've got transportation, they're dehydrated. Uh, you're starting them on feed. Uh, a lot of things, one of the things that's happened in the U.S. is that we've actually looked at, at not vaccinating them right away. Waiting to vaccinate, give them a couple weeks to a month from the time that they arrive so they make sure that they're hydrated, they're actually, the feed uh, is, is up. To, again, I'm talking now in feedlot cow, uh, but actually delaying vaccination because that, especially with the modified live, uh, and certainly some of the adjuncts will, be, will add to that inflammatory burden. 
And so being able to try to break that up a little bit um, makes a lot of sense. So, so I, you know, my, my look at that is that um, you want to make sure that you, you know, when it comes to using aspirin, and people use it in pigs at weaning time uh, and, you know, a sort of uh, different kinds of result. But I think the idea of using it in the transition cow, again, the Bradford paper looked at that. Uh, and again, they use his oral solution first seven days of lactation. And, and and I'll have to check. Barry spoke at our February 2017th um, nutritionist, and I know he was focused primarily on fiber, but he might have touched on it then. So yeah. I'll have to look back through that presentation. Yeah. Um, Paula has a question. Yes, I have a question from Pedro. Would you recommend the use of prebiotics and probiotics systematically in winning calves or fresh cows? So that it's, that's that's a good question, uh, and, and I, I you know you know my experience has been with those products is that you're I mean it, it, that people will tell you that in one group of cattle um, that worked really well, in the next group of cattle there really wasn't any effect. Uh, and, and I think what that gets back to is is the stressors. I, I think trying to understand a little bit more about stress uh, and the stressors and understanding the mechanism of action um, will help us, I think, in terms of being you know selective for that. I think right now we're kind of stuck with, you know, kind of one size fits all that we've got to, you know, if we use it, we're going to use it, you know, often across the board and not strategically. And I, and I think uh, once we understand more about, a little bit more about mechanism, then I think we can use it a little bit more strategically in terms of, uh, for example, one of the things that I talked about, uh, and it's not a probiotic or prebiotic, but it's but it's an immunomodulator, and that's that's zelnate, and uh, it's clear to me that with zelnate that if there's not anything, if the animals are not under a lot of stress, that administering that particular um, immunomodulator doesn't really have much of an effect. It doesn't it's not negative or positive, but but, it, but you know, obviously, if you're paying for something, you want to see something that's going to do, uh, increase your rate of return. So I, th I think right now that with the prebiotics and probiotics, um, and I, th that I think using them the way we're using them is, is I mean, I, I, I think until we get a little bit more mechanisms of action, we're going to probably use them probably, and I don't want to use the word overuse them, but maybe, you know, use them and maybe at times when they're not going to be optimal. Uh, but it's, on the other hand, from a, from a negative standpoint, there isn't a lot. Uh, I, I mean, that's with most of these things. I don't see anything that's that's negative, other than cost. Obviously, cost is, is gonna, you know you got to cost something. But um, I don't think they're they're not they're not like giving a gram negative bacteria, uh, which has a major effect on the immune system. These because it's local, it's in the intestinal tract. It's a regulatory thing. Um, I think uh, it's it, it it's less. There's less of a negative to it. Thank you. Um, so I have a response from Carl Cass. He he um, has given me the Journal of Dairy Science article. I'm going to paste it in the chat window for everyone. And when I send out the um, the email, I will let people know. Um, I will also include this. And this okay. was that <clears throat> that Journal of Dairy article. I have a question from Nicholas again. Nicholas Arias. Is it possible to increase the level of L-selectin by nutrition adding an X product, or how can we measure it? <laughs> All right, Nicholas, I know where that's coming from. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I think, so So, what we're talking about now is we're talking about neutrophils in particular. For them to move from the bloodstream into the tissue um, they use they they have a molecule on their surface called um, L-selectin, uh, and I, I think I, I think what is in, uh, involved there is, is is it's just back to to the an inflammatory response. So if you turn on um, IL-1 or you turn on some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, they're going to have an effect on L-selectin. And so I, th I think where that effect is um, is is a couple of steps down the line. So when people have looked at L-selectin. Um, I, I mean, I think it's not L-selectin directly, but it's actually because the inflammatory mediators that turn on L-selectin have been—they've been modulated. So that's where L-selectin. So, so it's kind of back to your the other question you had, which is basically how can you give something locally and see the systemic effect? Well, again, if 
if I can decrease inflammation so that that gut's less leaky, um, I have I have much fewer of the inflammatory cells coming into the intestinal tract. I'm going to have a less a systemic effect, and then I'm going to see less you know, L-selectin or, or things that tell me that cells are activated because there's an inflammatory response. Uh, this is from Carlos. In herds with leukosis and high colon rate, can you recommend specific management? For example, would you add uh, vitamin E? Well, well, I mean, it's you know, I guess the first thing I'd want to know in the herd is, you know, if I look at culling, you know, what's, what are the major reasons that culling are occurring? You know, in the U.S., you know, a lot of it is has to do with, with feet and legs as, as much as anything else. So I think, you know, there, you know, people have looked at, you know, at looking at, at zinc or they've looked at um, calcium and phosphorus and those kind of things. If, if I'm looking at kind of an overall, just, you know, there's a number of things that I see, you know, I've got, you know, higher mastitis, um, I've got, you know, metritis that seems to drag on. Then I, then I might be looking at something that, that's more, um, you know, immune, and certainly selenium uh, falls into that, vitamin E falls fall into that. I mean, if, you know, so if I look, I guess I need to look at from a, as a manager, I need to look at, you know, I've got this high call rate. What are the, you know, what what are the reasons that I'm calling cows, and then kind of work backwards from that. But I mean, you certainly you certainly can have an, an effect on that, and a positive effect on that. But I think you need to, again, you need to look at the numbers a little bit to tell you which which direction I need to go or what system is really being in, in probably influenced the most, and start there and then kind of work backwards. I think that does us for the questions. On behalf of my co-host, Paula Torillo and Tom Long, I want to thank Dr. Chase for such a terrific webinar. I think this has been wonderful. It's always great when we get some, some good question and answer time going on. I've been making notes of things I need to send out. I'm going to say thank you so much. Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed doing this. So This has been really great, and I appreciate it. I think it's a, a great topic, and um, I think people enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us. And everybody, thanks for coming back, or for the newcomers, thanks for stepping in and, and trying out the nutritionist. And I want to thank especially Carl Cass for the information that he dug into while we were busy talking. So everybody, have a good night. We'll talk to you next month. Thanks. Bye.